So this lecture is on randomized control trials. So what is a randomized control trial? The biggest uh, difference between any other design and randomized control trial is that in a randomized control trial, the patient or the doctor does not get to decide what treatment they're gonna receive. If the patient or the doctor decides that's real world, and that's how normally we practice medicine. We tailor the medicine to the patient's profile. But in a randomized control trial, we simply cannot allow that. The intervention must be allocated randomly to, uh, to the patient, which means the patient has no say in what they're gonna receive. When you allocate intervention randomly, we find a way to disconnect any of the patient profile information from the decision to get uh, medicine or placebo or treatment one or treatment two. By completely separating the patient profile from the allocation, we guarantee on average that the treatment and the control arm will be highly comparable in terms of all the covariates or confounders that we uh, worry about. RCTs can be controlled or uncontrolled. Uncontrolled trials are usually done as early phase one trial but the, once we get into phase three, for example, it is always, to, almost always a controlled clinical trial with a control arm. So in this COVID pandemic, we've already seen um, RCTs such as hydroxychloroquine, uh, RCT on lopinavir and ritonavir, and we also saw the RCT on remdesivir. And there are also uncontrolled uh, trials on these drugs, and there are also observational studies on these drugs. So the big difference between the observational studies on these medicines and the RCTs on these medicines is that in an observational study, patients and doctors decided who gets what, uh, and that was not a random decision. In these trials, it's a randomized control trial on these three medicines, the patient has absolutely no say in what they get. The treating doctor has no say in who gets what. The decision is entirely randomly allocated. That's the biggest difference between observational studies as well as randomized trials on the same medicines. And clearly the randomized trial is a better design because this is almost guaranteed to eliminate confounding. While observational studies, we are always worried about who got the medicine and why, and then how are people on the medicine very different from people who did not get that medicine. For example, in real world, uh, sickest people are given uh, dangerous toxic medicines that are unproven because they may be about to die. And that disease severity is a major confounding factor in the analysis. Um, the other uh, clinical trial, the large one that is underway is called the Solidarity Trial by WHO. It's called a large simple trial because the numbers are humongous. It's large and it's simple because the amount of information collected is relatively little. The paperwork requirement is less. It's multinational and it's multi-arm. So adults with confirmed COVID could either be randomized to local standard of care or local standard of care plus remdesivir or chloroquine or lopinavir with ritonavir or another combination of ritonavir, lopinavir with interferon beta. And the outcome is whether the patients will require ventilation, ICU care, whether they die or they go home and what is the date of discharge or death. So why do we need RCT? So as we've learned from the previous lessons, uh, causality requires a counterfactual comparison. So if I am receiving chloroquine, if I could also see myself without chloroquine at the same time, and if we could compare the two outcomes between me receiving chloroquine, me not receiving chloroquine at the same time, if we could see a difference between those two uh, uh, states, one treated and one untreated, it's same me, it's the same genes, the same profile, everything else is constant. The only thing that is different is that in one situation I'm on the drug, in another situation I'm not on the drug. And if we could see that, observe that counterfactual comparison, and if we find a difference between the treated and the untreated states, then the effect has to be because of the treatment. In other words, chloroquine is the only thing that was different between my treated and untreated states. So whatever outcome difference I saw must be attributable to the uh, drug. Uh, and, and we cannot observe the counterfactual comparison in any situation, but 
the RCT gets us close to the counterfactual comparison. Not perfect, but it is the design that gives us closest to the counterfactual comparison. So we can at least say something is causally linked with something else, which is why we consider this as a gold standard design when it comes to interventions. But there are many ethical issues um, in doing RCTs and um, uh, you, would, you would all benefit from a webinar dedicated to this topic. But for now, this COVID pandemic has thrown up some really interesting ethical complications and dilemmas. Um, when is it acceptable to randomize? In general, the best time to randomize people is when there is uncertainty in the scientific community on whether an intervention works or not. So for example, in March, when the solidarity trial was launched, there was genuine uncertainty on whether chloroquine worked or not, remdesivir worked or not, nobody quite knew. So when there is genuine uncertainty, we say that there is equipoise. Equipoise means we are on the edge. We are not sure it's useful. We are not sure if it's harmful. We're not sure it's useless. And when there is equipoise, um, one can justify why we are randomizing people to one arm or the other. But when there is an effective therapy that's already known, there is no equipoise to randomize people um, in an arm that is not having an effective treatment. When is it okay to use a placebo arm? In general, if there is an established treatment for a disease that is working reasonably well, even if it's not perfect, we simply cannot randomize people to placebo. So for example, if, uh, if you're managing uh, um, type 1 diabetes, we know insulin is a very important life-saving therapy. We simply cannot uh, randomize people to a new diabetes medicine and placebo. We can compare someone with insulin plus a new drug compared to insulin as a standard of care. That kind of a comparison is acceptable, but uh, we cannot randomize anyone to a placebo arm when there is an established treatment for that disease. When should trials be stopped early? When equipoise is disturbed, when we no longer have an equipoise, the trial may have to be stopped early. For example, during the course of a trial, during interim analysis, we might find out that the medicine actually works very well. And that's what happened to the circumcision trials. They found during interim analysis that those men who were circumcised had a much lower risk of getting HIV. And because of that, all three randomized trials on circumcision were stopped midway and everybody was offered circumcision. Um, in the case of uh, ongoing trials like hydroxychloroquine, if the accumulating evidence shows hydroxychloroquine is useless or potentially even harmful, then many trials will maybe forced to stop early uh, and the hydroxychloroquine arm would have to be discontinued. Um, remdesivir, we have one trial showing some effect, um, but is that enough to disturb equipoise or will trials continue enrolling people? Other trials will continue enrolling people on remdesivir. Each trial will have to make that decision and each trial will have a data safety monitoring board which will be in charge of making such decisions. So what is random allocation? Random allocation means all participants have a defined probability of assignment to one or more of the intervention arm. Allocation is not determined by the patients, not determined by the clinicians or investigator. And allocation cannot be a predictable um, allocation. For example, if you know the allocation is alternate, first treatment, the next has to be placebo, then everybody will come to know that pattern in a clinic or in a hospital. And when that happens, people can try to game the system or push people that they want into one arm or the other. And that creates a huge issue for uh, randomization. The most critical purpose served by randomization is if randomization is done well, and if enough people are randomized, not in small trials, but in fairly large trials, you will find uh, extremely nice compatibility in terms of all covariates, baseline covariates between the treatment and the comparison arm. Most, almost every trial, the first paper, table one, will be uh, a, a comparison of the treatment group and the control arm in terms of uh, various uh, covariates. So this is the um, remdesivir trial. You can see between the remdesivir arm and the placebo arm, 
uh, there is beautiful compatibility in various covariates. For example, the mean age in remdesivir arm is 80, uh, 58.6 years, and in placebo arm is 59.2 years, practically the same, 59, 59. Uh, male sex, 65% remdesivir arm, 63, 64% placebo arm. And that's the magic of randomization. Known and unknown confounders will be fairly evenly distributed between the two groups. Randomization also helps us facilitate with blinding, which I will cover um, later on in this lecture. So what elements uh, of a trial can be randomized? Most control trials will randomize an individual patient. Me as a patient could get allocated to either treatment or placebo or treatment one versus treatment two. Sometimes we can take an entire group of people, a village, a town, a district, a school, a family, and randomly allocate the entire group to the intervention, another group entirely to the control arm. These are called cluster randomized trials. Each group is called a cluster. So a village could be a cluster, a school could be a cluster. And why do we do that? Because the intervention inherently works at a population level. It may be very challenging to randomize individual people to a specific um, uh, intervention. For example, if you're going to uh, put fluoride in the drinking water of a, of a village, we cannot do that on an individual basis. You have to fluoridate the water supply for the entire village. So everybody in the village will have fluoridated water or not. So it makes sense in that situation to do a cluster randomized control trial. And even if there are thousands of people in each village, the effective sample size is still the number of clusters. So there are 20 villages um, in their treatment arm and 20 villages in the control arm. The effective sample size is 20 and 20 because within a village, um, there is a lot of clustering. In other words, there's a lot of um, correlation between people in a village and that needs to be accounted for in the analysis. So here is an example of a cluster randomized trial on deworming uh, and its effect on uh, malnourished preschool children in India. So they took um, of the 200 uh, urban slum areas in Lucknow, they selected 50 and randomized 20 slum areas to albendazole and usual care and then the other 25 just usual care and then they measured to see uh, weight gain in children and so on and so forth. That's an example of a cluster randomized control trial. How exactly is randomization uh, achieved? So there are basically two steps involved in any randomized control trial. One is generation of the allocation sequence and secondly, implementation of that allocation sequence. The second issue of how you conceal allocation is absolutely fundamental to the integrity of a trial. Um, textbooks have been written about how to get that right and what happens if you don't get that right, okay? So here are all examples, inappropriate and appropriate, of how to generate the sequence of allocation. Generating sequence means what is the sequence of treatment control, treatment control, 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 treatment, treatment, control, control. You can have multiple patterns in which the sequence is given to you. And depending on who walks into the door and is eligible, that person gets the treatment or that person gets the placebo, right? So in the past, people used to use very simple allocation methods, right? Alternate. So the first patient gets treatment, the next patient who's eligible automatically gets placebo. Then after that treatment, then after that placebo, right? That's called an alternative scheme. Or if you come to the clinic on Monday, Wednesdays and Fridays, you get treatment. If you come on the remaining days, you get placebo, right? That's also a type of an alternation. Or we will look at the last two digits of your medical records number. If it's odd, then you get this. If it's even, then you get something else or we will randomize you day based on the day of your birth, day of the week, rolling a dice, tossing a coin in front of the patient. None of them are good techniques for um, um, generating the sequence. Why? Alternative allocation, day of the week are all inherently predictable. If I was the clinic nurse and if I knew which days 
somebody will get treatment. I can move their appointments. I can take the sickest people thinking that they really deserve to live and therefore I'm going to deliberately move them to a Monday, although the appointment was scheduled for Tuesday. I'm doing it out of the goodwill of my heart as a nurse because I want to see them do better, but it is disastrous for the trial, right? It is no longer random. If the allocation pattern is widely known among clinic staff and among the people who are actually implementing the study on the ground, right? Because now they will do all sorts of things to game the system and get people into whichever arm they think is a good thing or not. And that could be uh, terrible. Coin toss, technically a coin toss, there's nothing wrong with the coin toss, right? But you and I know from our childhood days, we'll toss a coin, we don't like what we see, we will toss again until we get the head or tail that we like to see, right? Coin toss cannot be audited by someone else. I cannot come and check on you on how you did the coin toss. And I need an audit trail. If this was an FDA trial, they will want to send an inspector and audit how well you did the randomization. Anything that cannot be audited later is unacceptable as a way of generating the allocation scheme. The best approach to generating the allocation is using ran random number tables which you will find at the back of any uh, textbook on statistics or a purely computer generated random number. Okay, it'll be a bunch of undecipherable pattern and then you will use that to generate the code for who gets treatment and who gets placebo. Okay, now concealment of allocation is the next step. So you first generate, let's say you're randomizing 100 people to chloroquine um, and 100 people to placebo you will generate 200 um, uh, allocation sequences, okay? But how do you actually implement this on the ground in the clinic? And I think last time I gave you a beautiful example. If you put those 100 treatment placebo cards in an envelope and you gave it to the uh, clinic nurse and say, depending on who's eligible, once you consent them, take an envelope and then you open it, if it says, chloroquine, give them chloroquine. If it says placebo, give them placebo. Then the nurse could look under the light and check whether it's treatment or placebo before she opens it. And then she could take the envelope away and take the next envelope until she gets what she would like to see, right? So uh, a transparent envelope is a disaster. Uh, alternative schemes are a disaster. Any situation where the clinic staff who are implementing the randomization can subvert the randomization process is a complete no-no. You simply cannot have techniques which are um, not foolproof. You need a, a bulletproof technique for making sure that the clinic staff have absolutely no control over who gets what, okay? If they do, then you've lost all the benefits of randomization. So again, um, allocation posted on the bulletin board, transclusion envelopes, unsealed envelopes, envelopes of a different weight, unnumbered envelopes, different colored looking labels, none of them should be uh, used for allocation concealment. The best approaches would be serially numbered, opaque, sealed envelope of the same kind serially numbered because if, if anybody picked another envelope out of turn, you will know in an audit, okay? Pharmacy controlled um, uh, number or coded containers where the patient, once eligible, is asked to go to the pharmacy. The pharmacist knows nothing about this patient. He or she will take a, a coded envelope and give it to the patient, right? That way it's possible to be totally um, uh, uh, allocation to be concealed. Central randomization is the best. You have uh, an eligible patient, you lift the phone, you call a call center somewhere else. That person records the patient's profile, information, whatnot, and the person gives you over the telephone or, or fax uh, a coded number. That coded number matches to a box of pills or whatever injections. You take that and you administer it to the patient. You should not be able to know what is in that box and which coded box contains what, okay? it's perfect for even blinding, right? Because you don't know which is a drug and which is a placebo. It's just a coded drug, 
okay? It will not have a label written on it. It will not say remdesivir anywhere on the box. It will just say drug 606B, right? That's, that's all you know. You don't know whether it's placebo or whether it's remdesivir, okay? Now, take a look at how concealment of allocation was done well or not done well in the hydroxychloroquine trial, right? Equal number of cards with each group assignment was randomly generated by a computer. So far, so good. And we placed in sequentially numbered envelopes that were opened as the patients were enrolled. Okay, so uh, uh, generation of the sequence was by the computer random number. And then the methodology used to implement it was sequentially numbered envelopes. I would have loved to have seen the word sequentially numbered opaque envelopes, okay? <laughs> If the word opaque had appeared in this description, I would have felt very comfortable about it, right? Because trans transclusion envelopes are a disaster. And every one of us has looked through an envelope to see what's in it, right? So it's human tendency to look through the envelope and if it's, a, if it's not opaque enough, you can tell whether it's a drug or a placebo. All right. So uh, there are many, many, many different ways of cat categorizing or classifying randomized trials. Let me walk you through a few. Um, one is you can classify randomized trials as efficacy trials or effectiveness trials. You can classify them as superiority trial, equivalence trial, or non-inferiority trial. You could classify them as phase one, phase two, phase three. There's an, a huge number of different ways one could classify a trial, right? What's the difference between efficacy and effectiveness, right? Um, efficacy is, does the intervention work in the people who actually receive it, right? Among the few people who went through the entire recruitment funnel, who got tested for COVID, who agreed to consent, who had randomized successfully, did the drug work well or not? And it's a highly controlled setting, right? Most people will not meet the eligibility criteria because our CTs invariably have lots and lots of exclusion criteria. No, we can't randomize very old people. We can't randomize young people. We can't randomize pregnant people. We cannot randomize people who have had allergies. We can't randomize people who have liver disorders. We can't randomize people with kidney disorders. We can't randomize people if they have mental health issues. There's a laundry list of exclusion, right? So you get a very sanitized, clean, control, uh, well-controlled population, and then you say in them the drug works. But what happens if you start giving it to everybody in a, in a given setting, right? Effectiveness is pragmatic, it's real world. If you take everybody and you offer them a, a drug, and if the drug works in them, that's called effectiveness, right? Efficacy is in a very small, narrow, tightly defined control population, right? So think of efficacy as um, an artificial control setting and think of effectiveness as a real world messy situation, right? So most trials look fairly good in the efficacy stage, but the, in, when you roll it out in the real world, the effectiveness is actually much more modest because a real world doesn't have the kind of resources to run behind everybody, to monitor people carefully. All of that is very hard to do in a real world. So effectiveness generally is um, less optimistic than efficacy, okay? Superiority equivalence and non-inferiority trials are a very interesting way of thinking about it. All the three trials I showed you, remdesivir, chloroquine, lopinavir, ritonavir, were all superiority trials. The hypothesis was these drugs are better than placebo, right? And you expect them to be better by a certain amount and you power the trial to pick up that difference between treatment and placebo. Sometimes we explicitly think of non-inferiority or equivalence. We're basically saying, so let's imagine remdesivir is now declared to be an effective treatment for COVID but remdesivir, let's say, is very expensive. Let's say somebody comes in and says, I have a drug which is kind of similar to remdesivir in its action, but it costs one hundredth of remdesivir, okay? Now we say, okay, good, let's trial it. 
So we now compare the newer, cheaper version of the drug with the existing remdesivir by Gilead. At this point, what we are trying to do is establish equivalency. We are saying this cheaper new drug is at least as good as the expensive remdesivir. That's all we care about. We're not showing that it's superior. We are saying it should be at least as good as an existing standard. If we did that, that's called a non-inferiority trial. It, you, would you would be required to explicitly power it to be non-inferiority uh, uh, trial. And you need to explicitly say how much difference between the two you would consider to be non-inferior. You don't expect it to be exact incidence, but how much difference between the two you would still consider to be uh, equivalent. The trialist would have to mention that in the protocol. Here is an example of an equivalence trial. Comparison of an oral amoxicillin and intravenous benzyl penicillin for acute community acquired pneumonia in children, right? Intravenous injections in children is a nightmare, okay? You can't even get the kids wain most of the time, right? And it's traumatic for the kids, it's traumatic for the patients, it's a bloody headache. But if that is the standard of care, and you're saying compared to the IV drug penicillin, I can give the same kid oral amoxicillin. Now I want to show that the oral amoxicillin is at least as good as IV penicillin. If I can demonstrate that, then we could stop using a difficult IV treatment and go with the oral amoxicillin. So now all I'm trying to do is to establish um, equivalence between the two. Phase one, two, three, four are standard nomenclature in all randomized control trial. If you look at the FDA website, they will tell you exactly what each of these means. In an early phase one trial, all you are trying to do most often is to establish safety. Does the drug kill people or not? What's the safe uh, dosing range? And what are the major side effects that pop up? That's about all you can say in a phase one study, okay? When you are in a phase two, now you're suddenly starting to give it to more larger number of people to evaluate further safety and you're starting to look at effectiveness. Phase three is when you're really doing a control clinical trial. You have a control arm, you have a treatment arm, and you are starting to really collect useful information. Most of the trials I showed you are phase three uh, studies. Phase four is called post-marketing surveillance. Once a drug is approved, it's already in use in the community. You want to collect data, whether it's safe, whether there are any rare side effects that become obvious once you do it across huge numbers of people. Vioxx, for example, was a drug used for rheumatoid arthritis and other things. And Vioxx was found to be uh, dangerous for the heart much, much, much later because of post-marketing studies. And then it was taken off the market. Right. So even after a drug is approved after a phase three stage, you still need to worry about safety of the drug and post-marketing surveillance is important. And so phase four studies are usually post-marketing studies. And then in terms of how you classify RCTs, you can also classify people on how exactly they are uh, exposed to treatment versus placebo. This is a classic, simple two arm parallel RCT and you've seen that before. So hydroxychloroquine, remdesivir are all examples of this. You have treatment arm, you have a placebo arm, you randomize people to the two and you follow them up for the outcomes that you care about, right? This is the most widely used RCT design, a simple two arm parallel randomized control trial. Crossover designs is a, an additional uh, uh, tweak, right? So you start off like a two arm trial, placebo against treatment, but then after a while, you have a washout period where the effect of the drug disappears from your body. And that depends on the exact drug that you're using. And then you switch people. So people who started off with placebo now get the treatment. And those who started off with treatment now get the placebo. So this is even closer to the counterfactual design because each patient over a period of time gets to be their own control, right? Then you get to see what was the joint pain level when people were on drug across the time and the same people when they were on treatment, whether the pain levels better or not. 
not everything is amenable to this crossover design, right? You need a certain chronic condition and you need this drug to be fully washed out from their system and it should not be dangerous to remove the drug intermittently, right? Uh, for example, if you're doing a, a randomized trial on back pain and you're trying to look at different therapies for back pain, it might work out uh, to do a, a crossover uh, RCT like this. So here is an example of a crossover RCT. It's kangaroo care, where a baby is held very close to a mom's uh, chest, uh, skin to skin care, effective in diminishing pain response in preterm neonates, right? Um, you know, getting blood from a neonate is very, very difficult. We have to do something called a heel prick. You take the tiny baby's heel, squeeze it, and then you lance it and you drain the blood because getting a vein on them is very difficult, right? Um, when I did neonatology posting, I hated this part. It was too traumatic and it was certainly very traumatic to the mother and the baby. So here they were trying to see if the mom held the baby close to herself, whether the heel prick would be less painful for the neonate as opposed to when she did not have the baby in a kangaroo position. So the same mom-baby pair were alternating between kangaroo care and no kangaroo care, and they looked at pain responses in, in babies, okay? Factorial RCT is a very interesting, uh, fascinating design, right? Now, remember the solidarity trial already spoke about four arms, right? Chloroquine, remdesivir, lopinavir, ritonavir, so on and so forth, right? When you have multiple possible permutations and combinations of a treatment, do you want to do pairwise trials and then have the headache of figuring out which is better than which? For example, I showed you three trials. They were all independent, right? One looked only at lopinavir, ritonavir. Yeah. One looked at only hydroxychloroquine. And then one looked at only remdesivir. Now suddenly you ask a question, okay, each of this may be better than its placebo comparator, but is remdesivir better than chloroquine? Is chloroquine better than lopinavir, ritonavir? You can never answer this question if you had three independent trials. Because all you know is that each independent drug is better than placebo. But you can never tell whether one active drug is better than the other. That's because you've not done a trial directly comparing ritonavir against remdesivir or remdesivir against chloroquine, right? Now that poses a huge problem because we cannot use independent trials to infer comparability. You can do things like network meta-analysis to try and sort this mess out, but sometimes it's very elegant to bury multiple treatments into one single trial and settle the question once and for all, right? For example, remember there's a lot of discussion about hydroxychloroquine alone versus hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin, right? Now, let's say you gave both to a patient against placebo, and let's say it worked. Now, how on earth do you know that all the effect didn't come from just chloroquine, or all the effect you saw came from only azithromycin? How do you tease out between that pair of drugs, which one really worked, or did you really need both to work synergistically to get the effect that you wanted? There is no way to resolve this question unless you do a study like this called a factorial design. A factorial design could be two by two, could be more than two by two, is a elegant design, right? So think of a standard two by two table that I've been teaching you for the whole last full week. On one axis, you have hydroxychloroquine, yes or no. On the axis above, you have azithromycin, yes or no. Okay, hydroxychloroquine, yes or no. Azithromycin, yes or no. If you're randomly allocated to cell A, you get both drugs. If you randomly allocated to cell D, you get two placebos, right? You neither get chloroquine nor do you get azithro. If you randomly allocated to cell B, you're getting hydroxychloroquine, but you're getting a placebo pill for azithromycin. If you're allocated to this cell, cell C, then you get an azithromycin pill but a placebo for hydroxychloroquine. As far as the patient is concerned, they get two different pills. That's it. They have no idea what the pill contains. This design has to be blinded, right? 
you have to have similar looking pairs of pills. Only the code will decide whether both were dummy pills, both were active pills, and one pill was correct and the other pill was not. Those permutations and combinations can only be unbroken after the, the blinding is um, broken, okay? Until then, it's a pair of medicines that is given to the patient, end of discussion. They don't know what they got. Doctors shouldn't know what they got. Trialists should not know what they got. If you could pull this off, you will answer multiple questions in one trial. Is a, uh, is a combination of both azithro and chloroquine way, way better than double placebo? Or is hydroxychloroquine alone enough to give you the effect you're looking for? Then you don't need azithromycin. Or is it azithromycin that is truly the miracle drug and chloroquine is doing nothing? Every one of these headaches will get solved in this particular randomized control design. Powerful, if you do this well, you can nail multiple birds with one stone in this design, so to speak. Okay, then there are also uh, trial classification based on the uh, number of participants and so on and so forth, okay? For example, there is something called an N of one trial, N of one. N is a sample size and sample size is one, okay? This almost looks wacky that we would even have a randomized trial with one, right? But it's actually a series of N of one patients in a given trial. So let's say I have a whole series of people with rheumatoid arthritis in my clinic. And I wanna know which of the different therapies I have might be good for them individually, right? So um, let's say I have uh, Patraleka as one of my first patients, right? So for her, I, I, she's my eligible patient and then I could give her a random combination of drug placebo over various periods of time, right? So when she's on the drug phase, let's say I give her ibuprofen and then she gets a placebo. And then after a while, I switch that, but I switch them in a random order. Sometimes she might get one week of ibuprofen and placebo. Then next she might get two weeks of placebo. Then she could get two weeks of ibuprofen then when I run this over a long period of time with multiple pairs of permutations and combinations, at each period that she is on any one medicine, I check her joint pain. I ask her about her symptoms. Over a period of time, and it's her, right? She acts as her own control, and it's her genes, her comorbidities, her exercise patterns, whatever it is that she does in her daily life. And then over a period of time, I can finally unblind all this, and say, on average, whenever Patrileka was on ibuprofen, she was the happiest compared to the time when she was on some other medicine or placebo. Therefore, for her particular situation in life, for her genetic predisposition and comorbidities and her disease severity, ibuprofen is the drug for Patrileka. I mean, this is brilliant because it's almost like an RCT is being run just for your benefit, right? So it's powerful because you serve as your own control. And if you do this well in an off trial, it's extraordinarily powerful to know that this is the drug that works for me, okay? Uh, but it's not quite generalizable to the whole world, okay? That's a limitation of a N of one kind of a trial, right? So here's an example. Celecoxib compared to sustained release paracetamol, for osteoarthritis, a series of N of one trials. If you did uh, 50 such N of one trials and you aggregated them, then that becomes a useful exercise to see um, what drug is working or not working. Mega trials are also called large, simple trials. This was proposed years ago by uh, Richard Pito and others who said, look, by then medicine had reached a stage where it was increasingly becoming difficult to identify what we call small effects. Because let's say right now you had a heart attack or I had a heart attack. We kind of have a whole armamentarium medicines for heart attacks right now. We have thrombolysis, we have aspirin, we have beta blockers, we have calcium channel blockers, we have statins, we have uh, stenting, we can do coronary bypass surgery. There's a whole package of medicines and interventions right now, okay? They're all established, they're all being used. Now let's say I have a new drug for heart attacks. It needs to be extraordinarily powerful 
for me to separate that from a standard of care, which already has a lot happening. So the effect I'm seeing now might be very small. In other words, the this new drug, if it just is marginally better than what I'm already seeing with standard of care, I may have to do a mega trial to pick up that small difference. And the field is already reaching a stage where they simply have no uh, uh, no choice but to do mega trials because the uh, the differences they are looking for has become smaller and smaller and smaller, right? So if it's a massive effect of a drug, you can pick it up with a small trial. But if it's a small effect, you have no choice but to study thousands of people in each arm to pick up, say, a 10% or a 20% improvement in mortality because that's a small effect you're looking for. So now the field is large, simple mega trials, settle the question quickly and then move on. But because it's a large trial, everybody thinks that it should be simple. Simple means the paperwork requirement is simple. The consenting process is simple. The criteria are not too much. You don't have thousand exclusion inclusion criteria. It's much more pragmatic and real life. And you need to uh, have hundreds of centers to recruit. Each center doesn't need to recruit more than maybe 20 patients. But when you accumulate them across multiple countries and, and sites, suddenly you end up with a 10,000, 20,000, 50,000 patient trial, okay? Sequential trial is a very interesting adaptive design. Adaptive design means we don't know when to stop the trial. We're going to keep running it until we see a divergence of the treatment of the control group. We're not starting off with the fixed time window with the fixed number of patients. We're going to run the trial until the statistics tell us that these two arms are sufficiently diverging or until we reach a point when we decide these two are simply not going to diverge no matter how many more patients we add. At this point, we declare the study to be a null result that these two drugs are not different from each other. Okay, so this is a flexible sequential design. It's more complicated to do compared to the traditional fixed uh, size trial, but there are uh, situations when this sequential design is actually helpful or useful. Okay, now comes the classification based on blinding. You've heard of open label trial, single blind, double blind, triple blind, quadruple blind. What does that all mean? So blinding is also called masking. Sometimes you use the word masking. Sometimes you use the word blinding. Now, who can be blinded, right? The, the, the critical underlying issue here is, if I'm the patient, I'm sick, and you give me a medicine and I know what I'm taking, could that influence my reporting of symptoms to you? In other words, could I say, no, my cough is getting better because I've taken this medicine? Or could the doctor or the clinic nurse who's checking the patient for outcomes, could they report something different based on whether they know what you got? So if you are my patient and I know you got remdesivir and now I'm checking your uh, vital signs, fever or whatever, would that influence my mind in how I record things, right? We know from real world that everybody is susceptible or vulnerable to the placebo effect, right? When we take something, we almost immediately feel better, right? And that's a very powerful human uh, drive. I mean, the placebo effect has been demonstrated a million times and it's a very real effect. And if you do not worry about it, then you will create a headache. For example, I remember as a child, when we had fever, you know, we would wait it out, but if it didn't resolve, my, my mom would take us to a doctor who would uh, give us a, you know, painful red looking injection. I'm sure it was some junk vitamin, okay? I'm sure it was nothing. It was a placebo shot, we didn't know it then, but the minute we got the infection, uh, the injection, we invariably felt better, no matter what we had, right? So very powerful effect. Just the thought that we have undergone a painful injection made, me feel, make, made us all feel much better about getting over that illness. So in an ideal world, neither the participant should know, nor the doctors, treating doctors should know, nor the people checking outcomes should know, even the data analysts ideally should not know which is uh, the drug and which is the placebo, okay? 
if you didn't do any blinding, it's called an open label trial where everybody knows who got what, right? And we already saw some open label trials in this COVID epidemic. So for example, if you randomly allocate people to either a medical treatment or a surgical treatment, right? So a medical treatment for heart attack versus a coronary stenting treatment for heart attacks. Now those cannot be blinded, right? Doctors have to know what they're doing. Patient will know that something has been put into them. You simply cannot uh, blind such trials. You just have to live with the realities of the situation, okay? So single blind means typically patient alone is blinded. They simply know, they have no idea what they're getting. They get a red colored pill. They, unless they break the pill and get it tested in a lab, they simply should not know whether they're getting chloroquine or a placebo. Double blind means usually the patients don't know and the people checking the outcomes don't know what's the pill have. Triple blinding depends on whether the treating doctors know, whether the statisticians know or not, and it keeps going on and on and on. At the minimum, I would argue, any good trial needs to be double blinded. For sure, patients should not know, but the people checking the outcomes, people checking blood pressure, people doing the lab tests, people uh, checking on the ventilator status, all of them should not know um, which uh, group the patient is uh, belonging to. So I took a quick look at the three trials that I showed you, the hydroxychloroquine uh, study in BMJ, the Remdesivir trial in New England Journal, the Lopinavir-Ritonavir trial in New England Journal, all three PDFs are in your uh, Google Drive, okay? Take a look. The hydroxychloroquine was completely unlab uh, open label, which means mm -hmm. patients were not blinded, care providers were not blinded, trial investigators were not blinded, data analysts were not blinded. And that's a weakness in this design, okay? And they need to acknowledge that. Remdesivir was double blind. And I'm guessing that's because the patients were blinded and care providers or people checking the outcomes were blinded. Lopinavir Ritonavir again seems to be an open label when nobody was blinded, okay? Lack of blinding can cause bias. We call that information bias because the information that an unblinded patient is providing might be different from what a blinded patient might provide. Or an information sought by an interviewer might change depending on them knowing who is getting this drug or placebo, right? The probing we do, we might probe them differently if we knew one was on the drug and one was on the placebo, okay? So to avoid this kind of differential information or information bias, we like to see blinding, okay? I'll give you a nice example, which I already spoke about in the last class. They did this uh, controlled clinical trial of aspirin versus placebo, placebo for heart attacks in 1980s. Um, but aspirin being a, a bitter pill, uh, people um, um, broke the pill, tasted the pill, putting it on their tongue. People, some patients, believe it or not, even sent the medicine to a professional lab to get it tested to know what they were on, okay? This is called accidental unblinding. It was not planned, but it happens, right? When people um, try very hard to figure out what they are on. Now, why do patients do this, right? I would just say people are being people, right? We all want to know when we are in a trial, what on earth are we taking, right? And some patients were also found sharing their pills with other patients saying, look, I've tasted my pill. It, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's acidic or it, it, I think I'm on the drug. Here, you have half of my pills because I want you to get better. You're my friend, right? You are in the same ward as me. I also want you on, my, on the medicine to survive, right? People have powerful motivations to break um, uh, whatever it is that trialists uh, are trying to prevent. And generally, those who tested the pills got it right, which means um, lack of accidental unblinding in this trial did create a problem. And I've written a case study on it that you're welcome to look at, okay? Now, before I uh, finish off with this blinding, I want to tell you again that there's a clear difference between blinding and allocation concealment. Allocation concealment happens at the start of a trial, at the time 
when the clinic staff are randomly allocating you to one arm or the other. Mm -hmm. And allocation concealment means they should have no ability to influence which arm you are on, okay? So that's what allocation concealment is. Blinding is once the trial is started, you've been allocated to one, one arm or the other, the patient should not know which drug they are on or the people checking the outcome should not know one, which arm they are on. A big difference between the two is blinding sometimes is impossible to do. If it's a surgical procedure, there's no way anyone, anyone can really blind, right? But concealment of allocation is 100% possible. Every trial can do that. All they need to do is to implement something like a central randomization where you call a phone number, they give you a code and you have a coded box of pills, right? That's an easy, solid way to make sure nobody can mess around with uh, the uh, allocation. Bias in trials can happen at all stages. And I already covered some of that in the selection bias, information bias and confounding issue, right? Selection bias is when participants are accepted or rejected in a trial based on their profile, right? If you don't conceal allocation, I will preferentially put people with some characteristics into the trial and it is no longer comparable. And that bias happens right at the entry into the study. That's a defining feature of selection bias. Entry into the study itself is biased. And after that, you have a very hard time rectifying this problem. Right. If you do concealment of allocation correctly, then you get rid of a massive selection bias into the trial. OK. Information bias. We just spoke about blinding. Why do we do so much effort into blinding? Because we want to make sure patients don't know what they're on. People checking the outcomes don't know what they are on. Now the information you're getting is not contaminated by the knowledge that we know this is drug. We know that as placebo. Right. For example, let's say I'm on a hydroxychloroquine trial now and I've already read in the media that hydroxychloroquine can cause um, arrhythmias. OK, cardiac arrhythmias. Now I am taking the pill. I don't know whether it's a hydroxychloroquine or not, but suddenly I'm feeling palpitations in my heart. OK, and I say, oh, my God, maybe I'm on chloroquine. Right. So because I'm feeling these palpitations and I read in the newspaper yesterday that chloroquine can cause cardiac arrhythmias. So this genuinely can cause unblinding in a trial. Even though you have a, a blinded pills, right? The pills look the same, taste the same, weigh the same, um, smell the same, but I have found or I think that I'm on chloroquine because I have this palpitation and I think I have arrhythmias, right? Now, what do I do? Because I'm anxious about what I read, maybe I'll stop taking the pill, but I won't tell you that. Even though I am randomized to chloroquine, I'll quietly flush the pills down the toilet and you think I'm taking it when I'm not taking it. And why did I change my behavior? Because I got accidentally unblinded, right? So it's dangerous to, to uh, not anticipate such issues, right? Like the aspirin, people testing the aspirin, people sharing the aspirin, all sorts of wacky things can happen. When people share medicines, we call that contamination. The two groups are no longer comparable because the two groups are starting to look like each other, right? When people share medicines, you don't long, no longer have a watertight compartment of treatment against placebo. There is something called contamination in a trial, right? So again, one of the best ways to deal with information bias is to blind people, right? If you blind people, if you blind the outcome ascertainments, and if you blind the statisticians, which is the intervention arm and which is the control arm, you have a best shot at figuring this out. Only after all statistical analysis is complete, then you uh, unlock the code and you say group A turns out to be placebo, group B in the end turns out to be uh, chloroquine, by which time you've already computed the rate ratio, you've already done the analysis. Okay, there are all sorts of interesting other biases that we also talk about. For example, there is something called bias in not using intent, intention to treat analysis. This is a complicated issue, but I will just mention it because you might read it in a trial, right? They'll say analysis was done intention to treat. Okay, so here's an example. 
let's say you have 100 patients, right? Hydroxychloroquine, 100 patients in the placebo arm, right? The trial is fine because it has randomized 100 and 100 people to each group. But then over a period of time, 20 out of the chloroquine group were non-adherent. They, they just didn't take the pill, right? Or they took very little of the pill. Well, 80 was adherent, right? While 100% of people, let's say in the placebo arm, were adherent. Now, the, the statistical dilemma here is, what is the fair comparison? You take all the 100 control group participants and you only compare them with the 80 people who adhered, or you take all the 100 patients and you take and compare them to all 100 regardless of whether they are adherent or not, right? If you compared the 100 placebo to everybody who was originally assigned to the treatment group, that analysis is called intention to treat because you intended them to be in the treatment arm. Once they are assigned to the treatment arm, no matter what they did or didn't do, you still analyze them as if they got the treatment. The intention to treatment comparison, by and large, is a more conservative and less biased approach to analysis. If you compare the 80 adherent people alone to the 100 control participant, right, this group against this, then what you would have done is a per protocol analysis. Per protocol analysis generally will be biased towards the study intervention. Why? Because you're ignoring these non-adherent people, right? This decision, whether to adhere or non-adhere, is not a random accident. That decision was made by the patient. And the minute it's not random, you've lost the power of a randomized control trial. Why did I choose to not take chloroquine? Maybe I got palpitations. And maybe I've read in the newspapers that chloroquine is associated with arrhythmias and therefore I decide not to take uh, the medicine, right? Now that is no longer a random event. It's a systematic biased event. I'm allowing patients to decide whether to take the medicine or not. That is no longer a randomized con comparison. So that's why ideally all patients will be analyzed to whichever arm they were originally assigned, regardless of in the end, whether they stayed in the arm or they didn't stay in the arm. Okay, that's called intention to treat analysis. Then the last couple of things, again, I let uh, Sandhya deal with this issue in the ethics. There is always bias due to conflict of interest, right? Let's say I'm a researcher, I'm running a trial on remdesivir and I'm uh, on the board of remdesivir, right? I'm receiving money from remdesivir. Or if the remdesivir trial entirely was funded by Gilead, the company, which it is right now, right? How much is that a problem? I would say it's a massive problem. This fantastic research on all parts of the, from all parts of the world showing that when you have an industry sponsored trial, the results are invariably positive towards the product. Doesn't matter whether it's heart disease, COVID, whatever it is. Okay, this is rock solid data from months and years worth of work. In general, industry sponsorship is strongly correlated with the positive finding for the drug or the intervention from that company, okay? I mean, it's a miracle to see an industry sponsored trial showing our drug sucks, right? You never see anything like that ever in the literature, right? So invariably, there is also a publication bias that positive trials are likely to be published and negative trials will get buried by the industry. And then there is a very clear relationship between conflicts of interest of the investigators or study sponsorship with, that's why in an ideal world, we want clinical trials or studies done independent of the manufacturer or the company. That would be the gold standard clinical trial. Um, right now, I can see that happening for hydroxychloroquine because there is no manufacturer for hydroxychloroquine who stands to benefit, it's a cheap old drug. But for drugs like remdesivir, there is nobody but Gilead, the company. And therefore, if you really wanna know if it works or not, we need a completely independent trial, which I hope the WHO solidarity trial will provide to us, okay? And lastly, people also have this tendency 
to list some outcomes in the trial protocol, which is submitted to IRB, approved by IRB, posted on clinicaltrials.gov. But in the end, when they publish the paper, they whitewash and only pick the outcomes that look good. This is called selective reporting of outcomes. And the primary outcomes that I may have mentioned in the protocol might be X, Y, and Z. But what I really highlight or uh, only publish in my trial paper might be the best outcome that seems to work. In general, that's a no-no. Whatever you said in the protocol, you report those outcomes in the publication. And if you didn't, you need to explain why your manuscript deviates from your trial protocol, right? So in remdesivir, for example, um, the primary mortality outcome didn't differ much between remdesivir and placebo, but the duration seems to differ, right? But I'd like to know whether that was the intent all along, or was it an accidental finding that they're blowing up as the main outcome now post hoc, right? Post hoc means after the trial is complete. So um, power and sample size. Again, this is a statistically intense uh, area of work uh, beyond the scope of this course to walk you through power and sample size calculations and trials. But every trial protocol will have an entire section on sample size and power, okay? Um, every one of my happy students would have learned, uh, taken entire lectures on how to do this, right? For example, here's a Lopinavir-Ritonavir trial. And according to the paper, the sample size was set, set as 160 patients. Since it would provide the trial with 80% power to detect a difference at the two-sided significance p-value of 0 0.05. And the difference they wanted to see between the two arms was eight days in median time to clinical improvement between the two groups. Okay, an eight day time difference in clinical improvement between the two groups is what the trial was hoping to find, right? So power means, does the trial have enough subjects in both, both arms to pick up a real difference if it actually exists, right? If the real difference between the two arms is small, say a 10% reduction in mortality, 5% reduction in mortality, or a one day difference in, in clinical improvement, then you will need a massive trial to pick up that small difference. That's the general rule. Smaller the effect you're wanting to pick up, larger and larger the trial has to be. If you are expecting to pick up a small difference, but you have a small number of patients in your study, then your trial is considered underpowered. You simply do not have the power in or number of participants to pick up that small effect, right? So smaller the effect, larger and larger the sample size required to pick that up. And I'll uh, leave you to look at this critically, uh, how to critically read an RCT. There's a worksheet in the Google Drive that you can look at, or you can look at a series of questions, you know, how were patients randomized? Who was blinded? Were patients blinded? Was clinicians blinded? Was randomization done in a double blind fashion? Was allocation concealment done or not? These are standard questions that anyone will need to look when they critically read a randomized control trial. Okay.